Jeremiah. All right. Jeremiah chapter 7, and I'm going to do what I always do, <laughs> and, and throw you off by reading a verse that was in uh, chapter 6, not near the end this time, this one's uh, Jeremiah 6.16, I just want to highlight and bring it to fruition because this one is underlined in my Bible and after teaching through it last week. Jeremiah 6.16 6, says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where is the good way and walk therein and you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. And they really did kind of screw up, <laughs> like a lot of us do so often. But I think something that we can highlight, something that's always good, is ask for the old paths. What does that mean? The timeless truths of, really, Scripture. Getting back to the very simple, basic teaching of the Bible. That's the old paths. It's been a long time Christians have gathered together, but they've proven. <laughs> and those who have been braced and believed that really the old paths are the best paths. That's the truths that are timeless and tested through time, um, tried, and, and really shown to be true. Christians have found it to be true and we, we have this incredible kind of a legacy that we can grab onto because we don't need our own. We don't need our own thing to grab onto. And I love this saying, it stays true to the end. If it's true, it's not new. If it's new, it's not true. <laughs> It's a, it really is. It, it, everything that's been written down in stone, we should return to the old paths. Return to the old teachings, the old ways. That is, and, and really, remember when you fell in love with Jesus the first time. Remember when the Word of God was exciting to you. <laughs> and every word grabbed, you know, just seemed to leap off of the, off the pages. Get back to that. Remember the old path. Stand therein. It's a good path. <laughs> so, that's just review. <laughs> but it's, it's God indicting them and continuing to say, you get, need to get right. And the title of the message comes very plainly. You'll, you'll see it here. Amend your ways and your doings. So the word, verse 1 now of Jeremiah chapter 7. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Verse 5, For if ye thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if ye thoroughly execute judgment or justice between a man and his neighbor, if you oppress not your stranger, the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your own hurt, then will I cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will ye still steal? 
murder and commit adultery and swear falsely and burn incense unto, unto Baal and walk after other gods whom ye not know and come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say we are delivered to do these abominations. Is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it. I see the wickedness, saith the Lord. Verse 12, but you now go, go ye now unto my place, which, uh, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. So verses 1 through 12 there, again, the high calling that Jeremiah is called to. And that's to point out to people and the people of Israel there the mistake that they were making. And that's basically playing church. Showing up and thinking that this is all you need to do. In fact, trusting in the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. That's what it was all about to them. And the, the truth of the matter is we could become obsessed with material things. Whether, you know, it's uh, good enough for me. And we even try and say whether it's good enough for God. When it's nothing to do with the materials. It's nothing to do with the out, outward appearances. But these people were trusting in the fact that the temple was so beautiful. Trusting in the fact that there was a temple. In fact, the disciples did the same thing when Jesus said that the, uh, the temple would be destroyed. They couldn't believe it because of how beautiful the temple was. And he said, not one stone would be left upon another, right? And it came to pass. And they were trusting in the temple. There's a part of us that always trusts in what we can see or feel or touch. And so a lot of this has to do with religious uh, kind of ritualistic things that we trust in and, and really place value in. But in their case, something that's not so evident with us, in their case, they were turning to other gods. And notice that you do not know <laughs> And I love uh, the end of verse 6 there um, when God's saying, you know, don't oppress the stranger. Don't forget the fatherless, the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place. Neither walk after other gods to your hurt. God, and we talked about this this morning with borders and boundaries that God put in place. We think, oh, it's not fair. I can't run out in the middle of the freeway. There's a border there. But if I do run out in the middle of the freeway, it's to my own hurt. And God says that in the same way here. Stop chasing after other gods. Stop shedding innocent blood and doing all these things. It's only making and wrecking your well-being. It's only going to mess you up all the more. And so he continues... Oh, and also don't forget Matthew 21, 13. That should have sounded familiar when we read uh, Jeremiah 7, th uh, 11. 7, 11. I like that. Jeremiah 7, 11. Matthew 21, 13 should be kind of written next to that verse because that, that's exactly what Jesus quoted, didn't he? When he went into the temple and they were selling things in the middle of the temple. In fact, not just selling things, they were ripping people off. They would, you know, have to bring in these animals to for the uh, sacri sacrifices, and so they would look the animal over, and even if it wasn't uh, blemished, they would say, no, nope, this one's blemished, so you got to go get a different one. Oh, it's a far journey back to your house. Well, how convenient. We have a, a little market over here with with goats and with things, birds that you can buy. And that's exactly what they were doing. And it disgusted Jesus to see. And he said, 
My father's house should be called a house of prayer. Instead, you're making it a house of merchandise. <laughs> and it really, a den of thieves? That's, that we don't get that terminology, but that's like drug dealers huddled over chain, exchanging money with each other. That's the den of thieves. So they were really, you know, uh, desecrating, totally, uh, well, um, disrespecting the house of God. In the same way, Jeremiah is calling that attention to this. You know, <laughs> you're bringing in these gods, you're bringing in all of this idol worship in my house, in the house of God. And, you know, what is this, a be uh, den of thieves, den of robbers? Uh, behold, even I have seen the wickedness. Now Shiloh, in verse 12, he says, you, go ahead, go to Shiloh. What was Shiloh all about? Shiloh is the original place where the tabernacle would be set up. So some people saw that as, man, that's where God really originally dwelt. And I love this, because even the Israelites got themselves in big trouble thinking in their heads, God dwelt in that ark. Somehow we could put God in a box and carry him around and tote him around and we'll be safe. <laughs> and nothing could be further than the, the, from the truth. It, it doesn't happen that way. <laughs> and so, careful of that and thinking that God only dwells in that church or in that building, whatever building it might be, whatever church it might be. No, we cannot put God in our little Ark of the Covenant box, no matter what it is. If He could be, He could be stolen. How sad. Just like Baal. Just like some of these gods we're going to look at a little bit later. And we have looked at already. Having a God, imagine having a God that looked like a merman. Half fish, half man. And He gets knocked over and what happens? The head falls off. Oh, we've got to go back in and prop him back up. Your God needs you to help him get propped back up. I don't want that God. <laughs> my God supplies all my needs. My God is an anchor, a rock, a fortress. And so, so these other gods, what are you guys doing looking to all this other stuff? Entertaining it in any way. Verse 13, And now, because you've done this, all these works, saith the Lord, and I spake unto you, rising up early, speaking, and speaking, but you heard not, and I called you, but you answered not. Therefore will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein you trust, and unto the place which I gave to you, and to your fathers, as I have done it, uh, in Shiloh, Verse 15, I will cast you out of my sight as I have cast out, out of, <laughs> cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. Therefore, pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. Wow. This is the first of three times in the book of Jeremiah. Now this is only something that happens in the book of Jeremiah. God tells Jeremiah not to pray for a certain person, group of people. They are beyond help. And it's going to happen two more times in the book. In fact, some read that and go, well, I'm done reading the book of Jeremiah. Because what's the point then? If he's not even allowed to pray for these people, why, am he, why is he going to continue to prophesy and preach and teach? In fact, we mentioned this when we started the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah's whole ministry was to preach and to reach, to try and reach a people that would not listen, would not turn, wouldn't give him the time of day and didn't. He never saw anyone turn. So what's the point? Why go on? Why do it if none of them are going to turn? Because Jeremiah didn't know 
that any of them wouldn't turn. We know now, because history is past. It's a lot like the sovereign will of God, right? The sovereignty of God. You did not choose me, I chose you, Jesus said, right? Well then, why bother? I, I, there's no such thing as a choice then. God knows what I'm going to do. I guess I'm just going to throw in the towel and do No, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what you're going to do. And you don't either. God himself and he alone knows. And so it's, it's worrisome. You know, we should be worried when we come across these verses. There comes a time when you know what? <laughs> the prayers that you've prayed... God says, stop. I don't hear them anymore. The people that are, you're concerned with, that you're burdened with, are so hard, calloused, and so stone cold that there's, there's no reason for it. There's no way. There's no, and by the way, none of us have any idea when that is for any person. But Genesis chapter 6, verse 3 very clearly, you should have that kind of written at the end of verse 16. Genesis 6, verse 3. You all know the verse. God's spirit will not always, what? Strive or wrestle with humankind. In other words, God will not always be speaking, rising, what did it say at the beginning there? Because you've done all these things, saith the Lord, I spake to you all of these things, rising up early and speaking, but you wouldn't hear. I'm up every morning, God's saying. Will you listen? And some of us, it's a blessing. Every morning. But some, they don't even bother. You get up early and it's all about me. All about you. First thing we do so often when we wake up in the morning, right? Look in the mirror. Or, roll over and look at my Facebook. Look at my phone. Reach for my phone with my eyes closed. Right? Turn the alarm clock off that's on my phone. <laughs> How many of us reach for the Bible? Now that, I'm preaching to myself. I need to. We need to. We need to be concerned with the Lord early in the morning throughout the Scripture. It seems to be God is calling. God is um, there waiting to meet with you, with me. Early in the morning, in those morning hours when maybe the world's a little bit quiet still. <laughs> Only thing that seems to be making noise are birds sometimes that early in the morning, right? Well, God's still reaching out. He's still reaching out to people, but... His spirit, Genesis 6, 3, will not always strive with man. Verse 17. <clears throat> Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood and the, the fathers kindle the fire and the women need their dough. And they do. Women need their dough, guys. Oh no, it's K-N-E. A.D. Need the, their dough and not money. Okay. I was thinking. Anyway, you got, some of your girls can use that and take it out of context there. To, <laughs> but they, they would take this dough and, and offer it. What would they do with it? To make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto what? Other gods that they may provoke me, the Lord is speaking, to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, saith the Lord? Do they not provoke me uh, themselves to the confusion of their own faces? And verse 20, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, mine anger and my fury shall be poured out upon this place, upon man, upon beast, upon the trees of the field, upon the fruit of the ground. And it shall burn, and shall not be quenched. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, put your burnt offerings unto your sacrifice, your sacrifices, 
and eat flesh. For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day and that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. But this thing commanded I them, saying, and you might underline this, verse 23, starting here, what does the Lord say? Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that I may be well unto you. If you wondered what amend your ways and your doings meant, it's, it's kind of given description there in verse 23. Obey my voice, I will be your God, you will be my people. Walk in the ways and that I have commanded you, that I may be well unto you. Verse 24. But they didn't listen, they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but they walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart and went backward and not forward. Pretty plain lingo. This can happen to any one of us. In fact, it does happen. We are either going forward or we're moving backward. There is no neutral ground. I hate this, but it's true. There's not like, oh, I was growing for a bit and then I just stopped. No. You know what ends up happening? I'm sliding back. I'm sliding back. Is this no wonder? Is it no wonder God has us in Bible study in, in Sunday morning, Sunday night, Tuesday morning, Thursday night, Friday morning? Because, man, I'd be way backwards if I didn't get to it. Because what ends up happening is not I stopped for a minute. I start sliding back. Just like what happened with them. They went backward and not forward. With God, He's always wanting, He's always desiring that we move forward, that we keep going. And not, not moving backward. Well, verse 25. Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt, unto this day I, I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Yet they hearkened not unto me, nor inclined their ear, but hardened their necks. They did worse than their fathers. Verse 27, Therefore thou shalt speak all these words unto them, but they will not hearken unto you. <laughs> thou shalt also call unto them, but they will not answer you. But thou shalt say unto them, Jeremiah, <laughs> This is what you're to say. This is a nation that obeys not the voice of the Lord their God, nor receives correction. Truth is gone. Truth is perished. Verse 28. And is cut off from their mouths. That is our society, folks. Truth is perished. Out the window. In fact, Truth has become relevant to what you think truth is. So often, and we've lost it, and there is no truth, even on their minds and in their mouths. It's cut off from their mouths, it says, at the end of verse 28 there. Verse 29, cut off thine hair then, Jerusalem, you who belong to God. Cast it away and take up a lament, lamentation on high places. For the Lord hath rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, saith the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house which, I, which is called by my name to pollute it. And they have built the high places to Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire which I commanded them not, neither came it, came it into my heart. Verse 32. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be called Tophet, nor the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. 
for they shall bury in Tophet till there be no place. And the carcasses of these people shall be meat for the fowls or the birds of the, of the heaven and for the beasts of the earth. And none shall fray them away. Then will I cause to cease from the cities of Ju Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. For the land shall be desolate. Speaking really ultimately of the judgment, the day of the Lord that will come. Now this we, we should be reminded there in verse 31, and to simplify it, you could put it next to verse 31, abortion. It's very simple. They burned their children in the fire. They took their little infant babies, and this was to the god Molech, which was among many gods, and they would take their brand new babies and put them on the red hot incandescent arms of this brass statue Moloch and basically listen and, and uh, hear the cries and this what's interesting about this place that's mentioned Tophet that word Tophet means drum and what they would do this was a ritual this was something that they did unto their god Moloch as they pounded these giant drums in this place, which would become the Valley of Hinnom, the son of Hinnom, is later on, it, it becomes Gehenna, a, a place that Jesus calls hell. Gehenna, where awful things have taken place. And ultimately, that's where judgment is going to be. But watching their babies fry on the arms of Molech. Why would anyone? What is wrong with them? Why would anyone do this? Well, Molech told them in his teachings. Molech said, and they trusted Molech like we trust the living God. Molech, though, is a false god. And he would promise them that the spirit of that firstborn child would go into your next child when you're ready to have children, see. Sound familiar? Just like many young women are told in our nation, you could be successful. In fact, Molech is known as the god of success. It would go down as the god that would bring you success. And so, of course, you're not ready to have a baby. You'll have to sacrifice so much. You're too young. Wait until you're ready. We just don't burn them on the altars of a god, you know, false gods, the statue. But we burn them in the womb. It's much more gruesome. In fact, how can we let that continue? Thinking of, you know, generations past that maybe some of our generation looks at, you know, the, the uh, racial things that took place in their time, at their schools, different drinking fountains, different, you know, places that you were able to go and weren't able to go. How could you let that happen, Grandma, at your own school? You didn't stand up. You didn't, you know, march next to Martin Luther King Jr. How could you just stand by and watch that kind of racism go on and continue on? We would say, well... In eternity, when we all get to heaven, we're going to be met with so many in our generation, the worst of them. I'm among them. They'll look at me and younger folks and say, how could you let such massacre continue? Well, it was voted on and we would go to the polls and we try to overturn these different things. How could you just stand by? And let this just continue to happen. And you know what? Quite honest, we don't have any Jeremiah's left. We don't have anyone that will stand up for freedom, for right freedom, for truth, for justice. 
and ultimately the right to human life when it comes to a baby. And that's something that I, I put out there because honestly, it really should be disturbing to every one of us. Don't shy away from conversations about abortion. Don't think you're doing the right thing by just being silent. That's not our God. Imagine if Jeremiah was silent. No, we can't just stand by and allow it to continue to go on. And it, I'm just choosing that, and it's relevant to this, but there's so many issues. It's not just abortion. There's so many issues that we just stand by and just allow to continue to go on. And it's, it really is. It's shameful. And Jeremiah's, the, the encouraging thing about this is understanding Jeremiah was amongst people like you and me are among these kind of people too. Only difference, these people were in the church. These people were going to temple. In fact, Josiah, the most powerful probably, well, I say powerful, the most spiritual king, not powerful in the eyes of the world, but in the eyes of God, he did incredible things. Eight years old, Josiah became king. And it was Jeremiah's father who taught Josiah and instructed Josiah. And so most scholars believe, you can't be for sure on this, but Josiah and Jeremiah probably grew up together. And Jeremiah's prophesying during his reign, during his time, and then jo Josiah dies, and these people think that it was all Josiah and his doings, and trusted in the temple, trusted in the things, and not in the God, <laughs> you know, trusting in the house of God and not the God of the house. We can do that. In fact, people do that all the time. Thinking and, and being told, if you wear this, I forget what it's called, but the Catholics believe this. If you wear this certain thing and you ha end up dying in that, it's impossible for you to go to hell because you have this thing that you're wearing around your neck. Whatever, it, I forget what it's called. But, having some material thing, little statue that you hold on to, some material thing that you can hold on to, you're trusting in church, church membership, you're trusting in what we call church, and not God. You're trusting in the church of God, and not the God of the church. And it's, it's a danger. That's what, exactly what they were doing. And thinking and actually proclaiming. There was a verse that we read. I don't know if I'm going to find it, but actually thinking we have the okay to have these gods. Oh, it's the end of verse 10. I know it's backing up quite a bit, but the end of verse 10, they say, they say we are delivered to do all of these abominations. That's saying God has given us the okay to do these, to bring in our children and burn them on the altar, on the arms of Molech, and to, to do these sexual practices that they would do to the other gods in the very temple of God. Totally desecrating and basically just uh, disrespecting and spitting in the face of God and calling it okay, right? And some of us can think this way. Some of us can find ourselves thinking this way. That because we come to church, it makes sin okay. I go to church, so I deal with sin. No, going to church, it's not what it's about. In fact, even Bible study, fellowship, prayer, 
communion, worship, singing songs to God, having barbecues. It's not what it's about. It's all about our love for God. It's all about the genuine heart that just wants to be singing, to be talking, that's all prayer is, to be learning, that's all reading the Bible is, to be involved with God. Genuinely, not forced, not coerced, not uh, religious, because I filled out some membership card. No, God is into relationship. We've heard this. But that's what Jeremiah here in chapter 7 is. Ultimately, that's what God's telling Jeremiah to get across to the people. It's, it's, I'm not just some other religion. I'm all about a relationship. And that's one thing that's encouraging about uh, Father's Day. Every time I, it comes up. It's something that should encourage all of us. God is a father. He's not some distant, out there force that we don't have a relationship or we can't know. He's our father. And it's, it's awful to think or even imagine my kid, my own son or my own daughter not wanting to come or have anything to do with me. That's what our God deals with, with, I mean, probably 95% of humanity. Not wanting anything to do with your father. And that's God's calling to this nation, as, as he has been doing. And you understand, once you get to the end of the chapter, like we just got to, the valley of slaughter, where they were literally slaughtering, slaughtering babies by the who knows how many, thousands probably, millions maybe. No wonder God says, don't pray for these people. They're gone. They're far gone. In fact, they're trying to do everything they can to justify instead of amend your ways and your doings. What is that? Repent. Obey the voice of the Lord. Too many times when someone gets this pushback, here's the voice of the Lord. Here's the Word of God. Too many times it, it's, they straight away go to justification, trying to justify their own actions or ultimately trying to somehow justify sin and continue in, in their sin. Are we, and this, this was just a personal, personal thing for me, I had to write down some of these questions. Am I, are we going backward or going forward? Is my uh, character, is my home life, is my family, is the church that I attend, is it more holy than it was a year ago? My family, my marriage, the church. Am I moving forward or am I moving backward? Because like I said, he, any of us, can be going one of two ways. It's, there's no neutral ground. And God loves me too much. He loves you too much to just let you remain in your sin. <laughs> he loves us too much. So this is a test. In fact, uh, Jeremiah 7, 24 <laughs> is something we need to revisit. Jeremiah 7, 24. We need to revisit this time and time again because it is a test. It really is a test for us. Am I? Are we? Is my family? Is my marriage going forward or going backward? 
For them, big time. It was backwards. Oh, and by the way, the Queen of Heaven, that's a whole other sermon. But we've talked a little bit about the Queen of Heaven. She was known in Babylon as Semiramis. And she was thought to be married to Nimrod, that big Nimrod of Genesis 11. He started the Tower of Babel. You remember Nimrod. Well, Nimrod was married to this Semiramis, the queen of heaven, and Nimrod died. And all of a sudden, Semiramis, his wife, got pregnant, and she had never known a man. She was a virgin, this Semiramis. And they had a son named Tammuz. All of this is incredible, isn't it? And Tammuz ends up growing up in his father's... Oh, and, and Nimrod is known as a mighty hunter against the Lord, the God of Israel. The Lord. And that's exactly what Nimrod goes down in history as the enemy of God himself. And he has this son, Tammuz, or Semiramis has this son, Tammuz, who then grows up and he's out hunting one day and he dies. And three days later, he's risen. Only he's the son, S-U-N. Everything, and what it is, is a counterfeit gospel message. It's, it all started in Genesis 11. Some of it is touched on here. And in fact, in Jeremiah, this is the book where we get people decorating Christmas trees. It's in Jeremiah. Who are they doing it for? Tammuz, the son of Semiramis, who's the queen of heaven. And it's not a good thing. It's a false god. It's a false gospel. Satan is not stupid. He's very crafty. And it's amazing. It is amazing how many people celebrate Semiramis, without even knowing it. How many people celebrate Ishtar without even knowing it? That's a whole other sermon for a whole other day. <laughs> but it's one reason I have a hard time with painting Easter eggs. And it's every single one of our holiday traditions boils down to these Babylonian beliefs. And it shows you, it really does show you, there is a devil, there is a Satan, and he's very crafty, he's very wicked, he's very powerful. The whole world buys into it. Everything from the months that we have, and why we have 365 days in a year, why there's 24 hours in a day, all of these things have their root. And you could make yourself go crazy getting to the roots of Babylon and, and there will be the fall of Babylon and it will be great is it no wonder Revelation lets us know this is called Babylon and it's the, the world around us is Babylon and it's only getting worse <laughs> but we do we pray that the Lord comes and the only way out of it because if you just stand by and do nothing, you get sucked right into Babylon. The only way out of it is to obey the voice of the Lord. And it gets quieter and quieter. We need more people that will stand up and just say it. Just say that it's sin. Say that it's not right. In fact, more people that will say, the Bible says this. And say, and quote scripture. We do. We need people in these last days to just be able to stand up for the word of God, for God himself. And then another note there, when it says to cut your hair, don't literally do that. It's just talking about lamenting, grieving, mourning. And God's saying to the extreme uh, degree that you should
cut your hair, Jerusalem, at the, verse 29. You should be ashamed. You should be in grief, in mourning for the whole nation of Israel. Because they've forgotten their God. We should be in mourning for our nation. But we don't have to shave your head. Maybe do it once a year. That's good enough. But pray for our nation and be mourning for our nation and truly doing everything we can to keep moving forward and not looking back, not going backward, not thinking that somehow the answer is back there somewhere, but that truly we just keep our eyes on Him, amen? Keep our, and, and like we read this morning in Colossians 3, set our affections on things above, not on things of the earth. The Lord's been showing that one to me personally. Colossians 3, those first 10 verses. Colossians 3, 1 through 10. All of it. But the main thing is set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth. Otherwise, you're going to go crazy. You're going to get depressed. You're going to lose hope. <laughs> but if I keep my eyes on Him and look to the Father, and I love that He's my Father. He's your Father. We can look to Him because He'll never leave. Amen? <laughs> He's shown Himself to be true. Something I didn't get into, just so you all know, is how the Queen of Heaven has actually been named Mary, the mother of Jesus. And there's a very close and a very dangerous connection to Babylon and the whore of Babylon. And when you get to the woman who rides the beast in the book of Revelation and the connection, see, that is a satanic thought to somehow lift up Mary to the point that she's a co-redemptress with Jesus Christ. Nothing is further than, from the truth. In fact, when that woman who was healed said, blessed is she who gave birth to you and nursed you to Jesus himself, Jesus corrected and said, he who hears the word of God and does it, that's who's blessed. He shut that down right away. And the last, we brought this up before, the last words of Mary herself are, whatever he says, do it. We're not to lift up any human. And especially Mary would be totally, uh, well, she is totally ashamed by what they've done as, for, as far as the Catholic Church is uh, concerned with bringing her to the point of worship somehow and calling her this name, the Queen of Heaven. How's, how despicable. Well, I, I spared you, see? I didn't get into all that. Well, I kind of did, but okay. <laughs> Father, we thank you for your word. As we sing these last few songs, I pray that you would bring... Bring things to our remembrance, Lord. Bring things on our hearts that you would have us pray for. Things that you would have us um, ultimately be uh, really involved with, Lord. <clears throat> People that you want us to connect with. Whatever it is, Lord, speak to us. Speak to our hearts. Even as we sing these songs, we just respond in worship. Because that's all we can do. In Jesus' name, let's sing.